Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk Podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I'm the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed Conference every year. Head over to CanMedEvents.com now to learn all about our CanMed 2021 event that will take place September 29th through October 1st at the Pasadena Convention Center in Pasadena, California. And be sure to get your tickets at our special early bird rate. While you're at CanMedEvents.com, be sure to sign up for email alerts to stay up to date with all the news surrounding this industry-leading event. The best place to do that is on our podcast page, which you can find in the main menu under the media tab. You can also go there directly by going to canmedevents.com slash coffee talk. There is a sign up form on that page. And if you complete it, you will be entered into a drawing to win two CanMed 2021 VIP dinner tickets. While you're there, you can also listen to all the CanMed coffee talk podcast episodes in our archive. On this episode, I had the pleasure of talking with Dr. Andrew Horowitz, who is the Vice President of R&D at Sestina Bio LLC. Previously, Andrew managed the cannabinoid R&D program at Demetrix, where he helped develop the process for using genetically modified yeast cells to produce cannabinoids. We discuss the advantages of using yeast cells to produce cannabinoids instead of cannabis and hemp plants, how adjusting the precursor molecules that are fed to the yeast cells can produce rare and novel cannabinoids, how cannabis medicine researchers can use this technology to better understand the entourage effect, why understanding the way cannabis plants produce cannabinoids was essential to developing this technology, and how this technology is received by the cannabis community. Before we get to my conversation with Andrew, I want to thank this episode's sponsor, Demetrix. Demetrix is a biotechnology company that believes in the power of science to make the world a better place. The company produces safe, legal, and effective health and wellness products backed by science, including rare, high-purity cannabinoids for pharmaceutical and consumer applications. To learn more, please visit the Demetrix website at demetrixbio.com. And be sure to check out their blog at demetrixbio.com slash insights. And as always, this episode of the CanMed Coffee Talk is fueled by the Hemp and Coffee Exchange. If you don't know by now, hemp coffee is a healthy, delicious, natural product rich in trace minerals and nutrients, providing sustained energy without the crash of regular coffee. For more information, check out hempcoffeeexchange.com and use the promo code DRINKHEMP to get 10% off your purchase. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Andrew Horowitz. Good morning, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ben. Good to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you, with you today because the topic we're going to discuss, which is synthetic biology, and I guess more specifically, using genetically engineered yeast to create cannabinoids is just a fascinating topic. And I know you presented at CanMed 2019 on that topic, and I've included a link to that video in the show notes for people to take a look at. Um, and it got a great, great response. So I'm really excited to dig into more detail around that. But for those who aren't familiar with this process, or maybe haven't watched the video yet, I was hoping we could start and you could, um, use, you could perform a little explain like I'm five, the, the process of using (laughs) yeast to create cannabinoids. Yeah, sure. So, um, the, the basic idea here is that you, you obviously cannabinoids are made in the cannabis plant normally. And that occurs through a series of chemical reactions that the plant uh, is essentially conducting inside the inside the plant cells and then in the trichomes. And so those those reactions, each each step in that kind of assembly line to build the final molecules 
is uh, controlled by a protein or an enzyme that, that um, basically manipulates the precursor chemicals into the final chemical. Each of those enzymes is, uh, you know, the blueprint for that assembly line. It's encoded by genes in the plant. And so, so basically the whole idea of biotech in general, and, you know, specifically for using yeast to create cannabinoids, is that what, what we do is we identify those genes in the plant, which is actually quite a, a difficult task, but we identify the genes. Um, uh, and when you get them all together, you say you've identified the full pathway. Um, and then we put those genes into a yeast cell and you say, well, why would you use yeast? Um, well, it's because yeast are, are quite easy to manipulate genetically. Um, and there's just a ton of knowledge on how to grow them to really high densities in gigantic fermentation tanks. Um, and then they can just spit out those cannabinoids that you've, you've put in via that genetic pathway. So you're essentially identifying the genes in the plant and then um, you're identifying the genes that are in the plant that are creating these compounds and then genetically engineering them into yeast. How, are, how is that accomplished? Is that CRISPR or some other technique? Yeah, so there's all sorts of ways to put genes into yeast. And I think CRISPR is, um, you know, the most recent uh, trick for getting getting foreign DNA into a into a microbe. And CRISPR is really powerful, but there are there are a number of ways one could do it. Um, but in the end, essentially, you're you're getting the yeast cell to take up a piece of foreign DNA and and um, splice it into its own genome. That's fascinating. And I know that in the in the CanMed video, you sort of explain first how the plant creates these cannabinoids. And one of the things that was really interesting was that the conversion of CBG to THC and CBDA actually occurs outside of the cell in the trichome, which was really interesting. Um, but I don't want to steal your thunder. I was hoping that you could um, maybe explain briefly how the plant creates the cannabinoids. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because actually the way that the plant does this chemistry, and this is some really interesting chemistry that, and I'm not a chemist, by the way, I'm going to talk about the biology, but the way that the plant does this chemistry is both fascinating and creates a difficult sec, uh, situation for the genetic engineer who's trying to do this in yeast. And so that's because, um, so in the plant cell, um, let me just see how far to zoom back here. So when you're making cannabinoids, you, you, you basically take two precursor molecules uh, olivitolic acid and a molecule called GPP and fuse them together to make CBGA. And, and CBGA, so the A, by the way, when I'm talking about cannabinoids, uh, CBDA, THCA, you're, you're hearing that A there, that's because the, the, the natural form in the plant is an acid. Um, when, when that natural form is heated up, uh, the acid pops off, it's decarboxylated. I, I think probably many listeners would be familiar with that. And at that point, you get the more familiar THC or CBD. So it's the same for CBGA. CBG uh, is, is CBGA uh, without the acid on it. So just a quick quick explanation there why I'm saying A all the time. So, so CBGA is the mother cannabinoid and that, that's, that molecule is produced in the cell. But then what's really interesting is the final conversion of CBGA into these better known cannabinoids like THCA or CBDA, that occurs outside of the cell in the specialized um, compartment called the trichome. And I think, again, most people have seen pictures. These are beautiful uh, structures in the plant. It's when you, when you look at a, a, um, a, a bud, a uh, cannabis bud, you'll see the crystalline kind of appearance on it. Those are, those are trichomes. And so trichomes are essentially, um, you know, chemical reaction chambers where CBGA can be converted um, by enzymes called synthases, cannabinoid synthases, into uh, THCA, that would be by the action of the, the THCA synthase, or CBDA by the CBDA synthase. Those are the two major synthases. It's, it's possible that there's other synthases out there like the CBCA synthase, um, but those are the major ones. And this reaction is occurring outside of the cell, which is, which is somewhat unusual. Um, and that's what poses really a um, big challenge for the yeast engineer who's trying to make cannabinoids inside a yeast cell. Because as you can imagine, the, the situation in a trichome outside of the cell, different pH, oily, um, is very different than the situation inside a yeast cell. So getting those enzymes that are used to working in the trichome to work in the yeast cell, um, I think represents one of the biggest challenges for making cannabinoids by biotech. So that's interesting. So 
are there two separate processes here? First, it's creating that mother cannabinoid CBGA, and then is there sort of a, a second strain of yeast that's sort of doing the synthase process? So I think that probably most people would try to do it in the same strain, but but you have a great point there, which is these are it's kind of like two very different skill sets. Making CBGA, which happens inside the yeast cell and draws on these two precursor molecules, olivitolic acid and, and GPP. That's one, that's one challenge. And then it's almost an entirely separate challenge to then convert that CBGA. So it's, it's, it's I know that, that uh, folks have contemplated doing these, these things in separate steps, uh, certainly. And because um, you're really looking for, you know, kind of need a, an athlete that's, uh, you know, accomplished in two entirely different events. So um, I think that's a, a insightful way to say it. But I think ideally for a, for a, find economically feasible process, you would be getting it all done in one, one strain would do the full conversion of uh, production of CBGA and conversion into the final THCA or CBDA product. So that's ideal, but is that what, is that the reality right now or is that the goal? So I think that what you're seeing right now is a lot of the, um, a lot of the press releases I've seen coming out from companies in the, in the, you know, biotech cannabinoids field have been about CBGA and about CBG and, and CBG is a really interesting molecule, I think, with a lot of, of uh, terrific properties. I mean, something I would say is that, that difficulty, genetic engineering difficulty does not necessarily correlate with the value of the molecule on a um, biological basis. So what I mean is that, that it's, um, you know, it's more straightforward to make CBGA than it is to make THCA or CBDA, certainly. But CBGA is a great target for biotech as well. And so um, I think that there's been, you know, increasing awareness of how CBGA and the decarboxylated form CBG um, have a number of very interesting effects that you know overlap in part with uh, you know some of the profile of CBD, for example. Um, so, so I guess um, I don't know. I'm sure if I'm answering your question exactly there, but I think I think that CBGA is a great first target for the field, and I think that that pulling that all the way through to CBDA and THCA um, is absolutely going to happen. It's a little more work. Okay, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, are, are you saying that we're not there yet? Are we able to create THCA and CBDA oh, through this process? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And I think that something that's important to stress is that um, when you're doing strain engineering to make biotech molecules, um, there's, there's a number of phases. There's the phase where you don't even know what all the genes and the pathway are. And that was kind of the situation. I'll say, for example, it, uh, if you go back to um, you know, the early days of Dimitrix, um, you know, Dimitrix was founded based on technology coming out of Jay Kiesling's lab. And uh, Jay had, uh, and his, his team had discovered a missing enzyme in the pathway. And so that's, those are the initial things, right? Like we, you just have the, the minimum number of enzymes to make the product. And then you can detect the product, right? Like tiny, vanishingly small amounts. And then you're making more and more of the product. And at some point you're making so much of the product and you've scaled it up that it's economically feasible and you can go to market with it. And so my point there about CBG was just that CBG, because it is, um, you know, a step on the pathway towards CBD and THC and the other, call them terminal cannabinoids there, um, is, is something that I think the biotech companies are able to hit first because uh, it's, you know, it's a partial pathway essentially. So, but definitely, uh, you know, a number of groups have shown that THCA and CBDA can be made. Okay. And yeah, I mean, CBG is definitely a, a cannabinoid that's, that's on a lot of people's radars, I, I know, um, uh, especially on the cultivation side, trying to create um, plants that are CBG rich. And of course, that comes with its own challenges of trying to find knockouts in the synthase genes. Um, so maybe that's a good place to kind of step back a bit. And I, want, I was wondering if you could comment on how does this approach of creating cannabinoids, how is it? What are the advantages to it over traditional um, cultivation? Yeah, so I think that um, where, where biotech makes a lot of sense um, is when you're talking about rare natural products. And that is what, um, you know, I don't, there's, there's I've, I've said for a while, I live in California, that, that getting high is a solved problem. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think a lot of the, um, you know, in California for sure, 
I think a lot of the interest here is in these more, we'll call them the minor cannabinoids, things like CBG, um, things like CBC, uh, you know, there's, there's just, you know, there's over a hundred of these compounds, right? And we know so little about most of them. So I think where biotech really shines and where um, I think that it, it could uh, really add something is, is going after those more minor ones. Um, and I, there's been some amazing feats of plant breeding. Um, you know, I, it, I am not in that area at all. It's a different type of genetics. I don't know much about, to be honest, but um, you know, attending CanMed in 2019 and, and listening to some of these talks, it's clear that plant breeders are able to do some pretty amazing things. Get to get to to plants that make some pretty rare compounds in you know amounts I wouldn't have thought possible, but it's still very hard. Um, you know, you're you're for example, when you look at the um, you look at the varins, for uh, example, you're you're basically to get to get high level varin production in a plant, you would need to kind of shift the uh, the balance of, of fatty acid production in the plant. And these things, again, anything's possible, but it, it strikes me as pretty difficult because a plant's sole purpose is not just to produce cannabinoids. It obviously has to support roots and leaves and growth and all sorts of other things. So the advantage of the yeast cell in biotech is that um, you know, we can, we can re-engineer the yeast cell pretty radically. It's a single cell organism. It uh, really just exists to produce more yeast. And so we can redirect that energy um, and do things like, uh, you know, re-engineer uh, central metabolism in ways that let us really focus on specific rare cannabinoids. And um, so, you know, to the extent that you're trying to purify some rare cannabinoid out of a bunch of plant biomass away from other very similar, but you know, cannabinoids that you don't want, that's, that's much less of an issue in yeast where we can, we can essentially put in a very specific pathway that gets you from, um, you know, point A to point B, which is your rare uh, cannabinoid and, and have that be a, a single or, you know, predominant product uh, that's, that's secreted from the yeast cell. And so I think the advantage over, over agriculture, there's all sorts of advantages. I mean, uh, predictability, um, so the, the product profile that you're going to get coming out of the yeast fermentation, which is occurring inside a stainless steel tank, is going to be much more um, consistent than what you're going to see out of a grow operation, even an indoor grow operation in, in, you know, in, a, in a greenhouse. You're still dealing with you know, whole plants and you have less control over the, over the situation. So that's one thing. Um, I think the time, you know, it takes about, I would say, one to three weeks to do a biotech fermentation process to make cannabinoids. It's going to take, um, you know, three months to grow plants. Um, I think at the end, um, you know, I talked a little bit about the purification, trying to purify compounds out of a, you know, big plant mess versus out of whole cell fermentation broth. Um, you get a cleaner product coming out with biotech most often. Um, trying to think if I've hit everything there. And then I think, you know, the, the, um, the other really, really cool thing, and I talked about this a little bit at, at CanMed in 2019, is that there's this flexibility and optionality of the fermentation platform. Um, part, of the, part of the technology that Jake Kiesling described in, in uh, his lab's paper on uh, production of cannabinoids and yeast and that, that uh, Dimitrix carried on uh, was the ability to feed these uh, kind of precursor molecules, the fatty acids, into the yeast cell and have them be incorporated into the molecule. And so that allows you to build a single strain and then, then produce, you know, either, for example, CBD or CBDV, um, you know, the varins with different, different length tails on these molecules. And you can really just um, customize that in a modular fashion by feeding different fatty acids. So I think that in an unorganized way covers, covers some of the advantages of biotech, which is kind of precision, um, purity, uh, speed. Um, these are all, all things that are particularly important when you're going after these very rare cannabinoids. Yeah, I mean, I think that last point that you, you were talking about was particularly fascinating. The, the whole idea of introducing different precursors to the yeast and then kind of being able to not really mix and match, but like you said, to customize different cannabinoids. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that. And is it possible to essentially create cannabinoids that we haven't yet seen naturally occurring in the plant? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that, you know, there's an example of that in Jay's paper as well. Um, if you if you look at the paper, they, they um, use we'll call it precursor feeding to get some uh, features on the molecule that don't exist in nature and would, would set that cannabinoid up for further modification through things like click chemistry, where you could create libraries. So that's, 
That's what's known as a semi-synthetic approach. But yeah, absolutely. Um, you can make new to nature cannabinoids in yeast uh, by a feeding uh, fatty acid precursors that don't exist in nature. The yeast cell sees these and just says, great, and incorporates them into the pathway, pulls them into the pathway, puts them in the molecule. And so if you feed hexanoic acid, um, which is the you know kind of canonical uh, version of the fatty acid, then you get CBD or THC. But if you start feeding other fatty acids, you can cha change the chain length and get these other forms, both natural and unnatural. So I have to imagine researchers on the the medical side or the healthcare provider side, or maybe even, you know, kind of before that sort of the, the basic um, kind of drug development side must be very interested in exploring that and being be very interested in getting sort of mass quantities of these rare cannabinoids. Yeah, I think that's one of the value propositions of biotech is the ability to kind of provide samples of these rare and new to nature cannabinoids uh, for further testing. Um, I mean, I, it's I think that, you know, when you think about there's, I guess, a couple of approved FDA approved drugs in the cannabinoid family, basically. Yeah, maybe more than that, but roughly speaking, THC and CBD. So you got you know, Marinol and Epidiolex, and then there's some other variants of THC out there. And the question that I kind of struggled with is why why aren't there more of these compounds out there? I mean, they're so they're so bioactive, they're largely non-toxic. Um, it's a really interesting set of chemical matter that seems underexplored. And I mean, I think part of the reason is structural, right? It's been very difficult to do research on cannabinoids for a long time in this country. Um, but another another piece of it is access. I think it's um, you know if you're an academic researcher trying to get a hold of these rare cannabinoids, I mean it's you know they're they're present in vanishingly small quantities, and so and the chemical synthesis to get to these things is very very difficult. So it's very expensive to produce them. So I think that yeah I think that one of the one of the really exciting aspects of biotech production of cannabinoids, um, the synthetic biology approach is is the ability to get access. Uh, to researchers so we can start to really better understand what the uh, medical applications for this rich uh, family of compounds could be. And now I have to ask too, um, I have to ask about the entourage effect. Um, a lot of the researchers I've spoken to, healthcare professionals, you know, they're, they're very, I wouldn't say it's unanimous, but a majority favor the sort of whole plant medicine um, with the idea of there being um, different cannabinoid concentrations or even terpenes that are kind of contributing to the medicinal effect. How can this process sort of help them mimic the entourage effect if they're going to be doing some research? Yeah, I think the entourage effect is really interesting because it's, it's, I think it's been hard to get uh, you know, solid data on it, on, on it just because you're Again, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, most <laughs> most uh, drugs that are approved by the FDA are single molecules is because it's easy to understand then exactly what the causal agent is, et cetera. And so I think when you talk about the entourage effect, it, it gets very complicated quickly. And so I think that um, you know something biotech could do could be produce a palette of individual compounds that could be blended in ways that would allow people to, to um, test these questions. Um, you know, is the entourage effect in the same in one strain produced in one place as it is in another strain in another place? Probably not. Um, you know, I, I saw some really interesting talks at uh, the 2019 CanMed where um, people were looking at uh, very fine differences between uh, compositions of cannabis and, and seeing very different effects. And so um, for me, it's, it's really hard to tell uh, what's going on there. My, my personal opinion um, is that uh, the, the cannabis plant did not evolve to, you know, get as high or to, you know, cure diseases. Um, this is, you know, it's one of these things, the cannabis plant wants to make more cannabis plants. And, um, my guess is that most of the bioactivity of cannabis comes from a very few number of compounds, most of which are the cannabinoids. Um, but, I, you know, you absolutely can't rule out the potential for, for synergistic effects for polypharmacy. So. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a multifaceted problem, and it's becoming more and more apparent the more I talk to people in different 
sectors of this industry. Um, just, I mean, from a, a testing side, there's, there's challenges in even identifying these different compounds in the plant. And from the healthcare side, there's, there's challenges in getting a consistent product to really do solid research on. So I think something like this would, would solve some of those problems, at least, um, to be able to create something that's, that's more consistent or to be able to, to kind of tinker with the different, the various levels to really dial in the effect that you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that there's always going to be, I think there's going to be all sorts of, there's obviously uh, many, many applications for cannabinoids and many types of users of cannabinoids. And I think there's always going to be people that want to interact directly with the plant that, you know, even going to growing their own and, and curing and all these things and the story of where the plant was grown and how it was grown and, and all this. And there's going to be people that are just interested in the, in the single pure compound. And so I think it's, you know, it's going to be a wide range of, of users and a wide range of desires for, for what they're interacting with. I think you're absolutely right. I, and I think sometimes in this industry, there are sort of two competing camps of the single molecule versus the, the whole plant. But I think that there's room for both really. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to ask you about that you know, kind of being a part of um, synthetic biology or kind of creating cannabinoids through a, a non-traditional um, means, has there been any sort of pushback from the industry, from the more traditional folks that you've experienced? Um, you know, actually, I was, um, I was a little concerned about that, going to speak at, at CanMed, uh, you know, that there might be some folks that were angry about the idea of biotech getting involved and you know, genetically modified and all this, but I found people were largely, people were pretty open-minded there, largely, you know, interested in the science behind it and the access. Um, I definitely, you know, had some conversations where there was concern about, um, I would say two areas, one about, you know, genetic engineering in general. And I think I'm usually able to convince people that <laughs> all of the, you know, the natural strains we're talking about today are products of extreme genetic engineering, right? The plant there were, there were no plants. I mean, I read somewhere that even since the 80s, the, the content of THC in top strains has doubled or tripled or something like that. So that, that's all the result of genetic engineering. Um, you, can, you can do it by breeding or you can do it with CRISPR, but it's, it's all genetic engineering in my mind. Um, that basically creating organisms with extraordinary uh, capabilities. Um, so that was one piece, the genetically modified piece. And I think that the, the, the CAMED audience was actually pretty sophisticated on that one and understood how it fit into the general uh, artificial selection and breeding as one of these many tools to achieve these extraordinary capabilities in an organism. But the, the second piece, I think, is the one, the idea that, that you know, big biotech is going to put uh, the growers out of business. And, you know, again, I think that, that that's, that's pretty unlikely just because there's always going to be a market for, for the plant and for interacting with the natural molecule. And at the same time, you've got, you know, companies that want to start formulating um, these compounds into their products that are looking for a really pure, uh, dependable, steady stream of product and, and aren't going to move forward without one. And so um, I think that, you know, what I would say is that it's, it's a big market that's only going to get bigger. And so it's not like a zero sum game or where you cut a piece of the pie, it's coming from someone else's slice. So I think it's, it's actually a case where um, the number of applications is going to increase because of biotech and you're always going to have growing. So. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I did want to ask you about terpenes. Um, we've talked a lot about cannabinoids. Um, is there an application for using biotech to generate terpenes or are they sort of more of a, um, a common compound that's not really applicable? So that's a that's a great question. It's funny because my most of my career in industrial sin bio has been centered on terpenes, and so I <clears throat> cool. I started out working at Amaris, a company called Amaris that's also in the the biotech cannabinoids game at this point. Um, and you know I left I left before they got into that, but Amaris was founded around um, the concept of producing terpenes in yeast, and so they've now made you know at least a dozen different terpenes and scaled them up to you know, multi-ton scale uh, through fermentation. And, and so um, the, you know, cannabinoid pathway itself, that GPP molecule I was talking about that gets put together with a libitolic acid to make CBGA, 
TPP is 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 the precursor to terpenes. It's it's a uh, so and the, and the cannabinoid molecule itself is what's known as a meroterpene. It's part part terpene. And so then, of course, you're talking about the terpenes in the plant that give the the flavor and the you know the the um, sensory experience of, of cannabis. Um, and then and then of course also have been cited in the entourage effect. I should mention that. But but yeah, absolutely, these are great targets uh, for for biotech. And um, in fact, I would say that mastering terpene production in in yeast was kind of a necessary precursor to making cannabinoids in yeast. Very cool. So one of the common refrains in these conversations that I'm having with people in the industry is that there are still things, still a lot of things that we don't know about cannabis. And I wanted to ask you, are there things that we still don't know about how the, the plant creates cannabinoids that would be valuable information for uh, biotech? Yeah, absolutely. I think it were, you know, the, now, like I was saying, it was only, you know, maybe four, four years ago or so that the, the full genetic pathway was described with the discovery of this missing enzyme by the Kiesling lab. And um, so it's not like we've known about this for years. You know, we've had the, the genome sequence of the plant for, I'm going to probably get this wrong, but I would say about a decade now. Um, and we've had a full pathway for about four years, but I'd say we're at the very beginning of understanding how the plant works. And so, you know, while I think we can describe exactly how to make THCA or CBDA or the variants of those, um, the varin variants of those, you start getting into the more rare cannabinoids. And it's, it's, it's not totally clear, at least to me, um, you know, if, if um, how those are made by the plant. And so, you know, whether they represent chemical breakdown products of, of uh, molecules that we know how they're made in the plant, we know that's the case for some of them, or whether there's, um, you know, a whole slew of different enzymes that are acting on um, on CBGA and other molecules to get there. So yeah, absolutely a ton to learn from the plant still. Excellent, always happy to hear that. So winding down here, I did just want to give you an opportunity to let the audience know where they can learn more about what we've talked about, more about what you're doing, um, floor is yours. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, I think that, you know, in terms of um, understanding uh, biotech cannabinoids, uh, you know, the, the company I was formerly with, Demetrix, has put out a really excellent series of blog posts, um, kind of uh, trying to break down the science for the, for the popular audience. And so I know they've got a, a, a few on um, CBGA, uh, CBG, the, the, you know, the science and the chemistry there. And so that's, that's a great one. I would check out the Demetrix website and try to learn more about what they're up to. Um, so I think that's the, I think that's a great starting point on the biotech side. Um, you know, if, if, um, someone wants to really get deep into it and, uh, maybe has a little more of a background, I would read Jay Keesling's paper from 2018 on the, the biotech production of cannabinoids. That's a, that's a excellent one, obviously. Um, so personally, um, I, I left Demetrix, um, about middle of this, uh, last year in 2020. Um, entirely for a personal opportunity. I got the chance to do another startup. I love, I love doing startups. So when I joined Demetrix, I was, I think, the fourth, fourth employee there. You know, they, there was no lab. It was empty. We had to build everything from scratch. And I love that early phase where you're going from, from zero production to something. It's a, you know, that first step is an infinite increase, right? So, uh, so that's really exciting to me. And I like building, building out an early R&D team. And so um, you know, about the middle of last year, I got the opportunity to do that at a new company that's called Sestina. And um, Sestina is um, also in the industrial, well, in the, it will call it in the synthetic biology space, similar to Demetrix. We're not doing cannabinoids. Um, I think what's really interesting about Sestina is that we're, we're focused on kind of miniaturizing the, the R&D uh, process. So a lot of the um, discovery and work in R&D is done in what are called 96 well plates, which are kind of like 96 tiny flasks that you can grow, grow cells in. And what Sestina is doing is that they're, they're um, trying to move away from those plates, which physically take up a lot of space and limit the number of um, variants of these strains you're building you can look at and move into single cell technologies. Um, and so now instead of having cells growing in 96 well plates, you have cells inside of droplets or single cells, and there's a number of ways to do it. So that's one piece of it. And the other piece of it is that um, we're partnered with uh, a company called Inscripta, which has made this uh, gene editing box called the Onyx. 
And the Onyx allows for this, you know, massively multi-parallel genome editing where you can basically um, redesign entire genomes in microbes like yeast. And so it's really powerful and allows us to get really deep into the biology that influences the production of these, these biotech target molecules. And so, um, you know, this was, those two things I think were really exciting to me. And so I, I jumped at the opportunity to do that. And um, we're at this point, you know, running a screening operation, the lab is up and going and uh, having a great time. Wow, that sounds amazing. And I will certainly put links to the resources that you that you mentioned into the show description. So if anyone's interested, you can definitely check that out. So, all right. Thanks again for joining us, Andrew. Um, and thanks, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the CanMed team as well at, for being a, a scientific advisor and helping us to, to choose the presenters for this year's event. Um, it's always very helpful. And I hope to see you out in Pasadena. Absolutely. This was really fun, Ben. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Andrew Horowitz. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, Demetrix. Our next episode will drop March 10th. In the meantime, please go to canmedevents.com slash coffee talk and sign up for email updates. That will enter you into a drawing to win two tickets to our CanMed 2021 VIP dinner and keep you up to date with all things CanMed 2021. If social media is your thing, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. And lastly, if you are listening via a podcast app, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so that new episodes automatically download to your device. And please leave us a five-star review as well. All right, that's it from us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be sure to come back for the next episode of CanMed Coffee Talk.